There are few things more interesting than eschatology and the study of the millennium and the new heaven and the new earth and the coming of the Lord and the manifestation of the Antichrist. All of those subjects are intriguing and they have to do with you and I and earth life and the history of earth. We're studying them right now, so stay with us today. Yesterday, we began a study on the very interesting subject of the millennium. Where else are you going to go to find somebody talking about the millennium? Well, the millennium is a subject that's very important. And early Christians were talking about this time coming of the kingdom when the Messiah would reign on earth. They were talking about it constantly. It's a big subject in the Old Testament. It's a big subject in the New Testament. And yesterday, we talked about this. We also talked about the fact that it was so prominent that early Christians were actually identified as, if you use English, it would be chilius. In Greek, it would be something like hilius. And C-H-I-L-I-A-S-T-S, hilius. Uh, it comes from hilioi. But anyway, it's the Greek, and it's derived also, uh, uh, which means thousand. It means thousand. And so New, New, New Testament Christians were called heliast or thousand, meaning millennialists. They were people, we would say today, millennialists. They were people who believed in the coming kingdom. And uh, that's how prominent it was, that it was a byword name for Christians. So we know what the New Testament believed about it, what was prominent, what was primary. And uh, they believed in a coming millennium of a thousand years, just as described in Revelation 20. And seeing how encompassing the description was caused one historian, I mentioned yesterday as we get back on track here, uh, Harnack, to say that Hiliasm, as the post-apostolic church emerged was, and I'm quoting, inseparably associated with the gospel itself. This same guy, Adolf Harnack, goes on to state, the doctrine of Christ's second advent and the kingdom appears so early that it might be questioned whether it ought not to be regarded as an essential part of the Christian religion. This is how prominent this was in the early days. Now, now I'm not talking about today, and I'm not arguing with anybody. I'm just saying this is a pretty strong, um, this is a pretty strong foundation that that history can document, and I'll document a little bit more of it here before we go on, of what the New Testament church believed, what the apostles taught, and what was believed by the first believers post-apostolic, after the time that the apostles had passed away. We already know that it was prominent in the Old Testament. We know that the Pharisees were mixed up at the coming of Jesus because they were believing for this kingdom to eventually come, and we're looking for it to come after the order of Rome, like coercion and force and so forth. So they missed the king. But Jesus told them very clearly in Mark chapter 1 that the time is at hand. The time of the kingdom is at hand. And so the, the idea of a future coming kingdom and a future coming king uh, emerged out of the age of the apostles. Uh, now, <clears throat> There's a lot of things we could quote here, but I, I just want to validate this. I don't want you to think I'm just making this up. Uh, George Henry Peters, uh, a historian, has done extensive research uh, in a work in a book called The Theocratic Kingdom. And following are just a few quotes that he found from his research um, of the early Post-apostolic age, the time I'm talking about just when the apostles were passing away and the first believers. So here's the question. Were they going to carry on in the belief that the apostles taught about uh, the coming millennium, the coming kingdom of Christ? Would this continue to be? And so one of the foremost church historians in the world, Philip Schaff, states that I quote, the most striking point of the Antinocene age is the prominent hiliasm, or we would say chiliasm, or millenarianism. 
that is the belief of a visible reign of Christ in glory on earth with the risen saints for a thousand years. He's saying this is the most remarkable teaching. This is the most um, uh, prominent teaching that came out of the New Testament, along with, of course, the gospel. In remarkable fashion, I, it's, it's just amazing that these men wrote this. Justin Martyr, who lived, now get this, he lived from 100 A.D. to 165 A.D., all right? So John, the apostle, died around 100 A.D., maybe even a little later. We don't know exactly when he died, uh, but Justin Martyr wrote this. This is in his writings. He wrote, a certain man with us named John, one of the apostles of Christ, predicted that those who believed in our Christ would spend a thousand years in Jerusalem. Now, here's this guy, 100-165 AD. He's almost a contemporary with the apostle John. Maybe was for a couple of years. I don't know. Uh, I don't guess any of us know. But uh, he was in that era, and and he writes here what John had to say about the fact that those who believed in Christ would spend a thousand years in Jerusalem. So all of this just to show that this is what this is what comes out of the New Testament. Then uh, Arrhenius or Irenaeus who lived from 130 A.D. to 202 A.D. He further explains, and I'm quoting uh, Arrhenius or Irenaeus, when the Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three years and six months and sit in the temple at Jerusalem, and then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds, bringing in for the righteousness the times of the kingdom. So here's a, here's a pretty clear, pretty, I mean, incredibly graphic description that uh, Irenaeus is making here of the kingdom. And he even talks about that the kingdom, and there's, there's a lot that could be said about this, and this can be proved conclusively when you get into Thessalonians, but that the kingdom, the coming to the kingdom of Christ is tied repeatedly in Scripture as well as in history like we're just talking about right now. It is tied to the coming of the Antichrist and that the vanquishing of the Antichrist is done by the second coming of Christ in which every eye will see him, every, every eye will behold him. And so at that second coming it will be the vanquishing of the Antichrist. It will be the people of God who'd been fooled by the Antichrist. We'll go into this a little deeper later. But they are fooled by the Antichrist, and they sign a peace agreement with the Antichrist, and they believe that the Antichrist is the Christ. Jesus himself said in John 5, 43, I come in my Father's name, and you do not receive or believe me but another will come in his own name. Him will you receive. And so Christ here himself is predicting the coming of the Antichrist, who is anti-meaning counterfeit Christ, who will come as a counterfeit Christ, and they are going to be embraced by the people of God. Jesus himself is affirming this fact here. That Antichrist will be, he will, he will be dishonest, he will be wicked, he will be the serpent seed son of the serpent. He will be whatever that means. He's called the son of perdition. Uh, and that Antichrist at the, uh, at the end of the age, at the end of the church age, at the end of the day of the Lord, he will be vanquished by the coming of Christ. The people will have turned back and received Christ as Lord. Those who have rejected him and have not believed he is the Messiah, which is the Jews, they will turn to him. They will recognize their mistake. There will be great repentance. They will turn to him, which will create great revival. And this will bring back his second coming. And so these things were not strange to the apostles and to the days of the apostles and the days immediately succeeding the apostles, because we're seeing it right here. This is the writings of these people. Tertullian was about this same time. He was a little later. He lived from 155 A.D. to 220 A.D. 
And so Tertullian adds to this, and he says, But we confess that a kingdom is promised us upon the earth for a thousand years in the divinely built city of Jerusalem. So here's a testimony of three prominent early biblical theologians and historians who were acquainted with either the last of the apostles themselves or they were acquainted with the people who were taught by the apostles themselves. And these are the things. They are giving us what they were taught. So all we're doing right now is giving a little groundwork of where the doctrine of the millennium came from. Other than Scripture itself, it was carried on by these early believers. Now, we could make many more quotes. Uh, I could cite many more quotes from people of this same era. The important realization here is, is not getting a bunch of quotes, but it is that here is what teaching emerged from the disciples and from the apostles and was embraced by apostolic trained disciples in earliest post-apostolic years. So there can be no question that the primary teaching included a coming literal millennial kingdom in which the thousand-year declaration of John six times repeated in the first seven verses of Revelation 20, that it was taken literally, just as it was written, just as John wrote it. And so there is no kingdom where there is no king. Thus, the second coming of Christ will be a glorious introduction to the world of the conquering King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Scripture gives us examples of this. And we will talk about these examples in upcoming lessons. Thank you for being with me today. We will see you Monday, God willing.